sing that again. Do you understand the greatness of this salvation? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me tell you where I am, church. I'm praying for a mighty move of the Holy Spirit. Yes, thank you, Lord. In my life yes, and in your thank life. You, Lord. Yes. Amen. 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 There's nothing that a move of God cannot cure or cannot correct. That's right. Amen. Amen. I've got a message on my heart, and I want to share it with you it's um and i'm gonna walk out on a limb here and just tell you this this is a meaty message i mean if you know what i mean by that this is a message that you can carry with you and that will stick with you you'll find the notes in the lobby at the end of the service I'm going to give you the title that I have written down because I want to cover some things in this service. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid growing up, I didn't advertise the fact that I went to a Pentecostal church. In the first place, the first 16 years of my life, I was not a Christian. And of course, Initially, when they talked about holy rollers, I didn't realize they were talking about my mom and dad and some of my closest friends. But I grew up, I received the Holy Spirit when I was 16. Believe radically and dogmatically in the personal work of the Holy Spirit. I've seen people of all walks of life who have been filled with the Holy Spirit. It can make such an incredible difference in your life. I found out that what we believe is true. I need to repeat that. I found out what we believe is true. And so we don't have to be on the defensive. Did you know that if somebody accuses you of being in the wrong or being wrong, they have to prove it. You don't have to disprove it. They have to prove it. And so I want you to listen to this message today. I want you to listen to the two scriptures that I'm going to use as a text. And before I get started, let me just remind you that you don't need the Holy Spirit to go to heaven. The blood of Jesus Christ will get you in. It will get you through. And it will get you out and into now, if you're half as smart as I think you are, you know what I mean by that. It'll get you into the family of God, into a place of salvation, forgiveness. It'll keep you through this world of wickedness and ungodliness. When that trumpet sounds and the Lord descends, it'll get you out of here and into heaven to the Father's house. But I will tell you this. Is everybody in the house listening to me? You cannot, you cannot live as good without the Holy Spirit you can with him. If you realize that, 
And having the Holy Spirit is not all about speaking in tongues. Although speaking in tongues will help you tremendously. You. And the Lord can also use that to speak to his people with a supernatural message from him. Brother Dole, are you ready for this title? <laughs> Receiving the Holy Spirit, being filled with him, and having him and being dwelt by him was the norm among the early church. You know, I, I hear people, they say, man, we want to have a New Testament church. and <laughs> You better go to the book of Acts. And you better tap into what I'm going to be preaching about this morning if you want to get anywhere close to being a New Testament or an apostolic church. Two texts. Ephesians 5, 18, and do not get drunk with wine, where is debauchery or riotous living, but be filled with the Spirit. I'll just tell you this right up front. That last phrase that I read to you is a command that was given by Paul through the Holy Spirit to believers in the church at Ephesus. And then in Acts 19, verses 1 and 2, I want you to focus on a question here that Paul asked by people who are described as certain disciples. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? That's a very powerful, that's a very appropriate question. Just for your information, just for your information, let me read to you two statements that are in the minutes of the Church of God, of which we are a part, that relate to when a person can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. First of all, under the Declaration of Faith, Article 8 says, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost subsequent to, subsequent to a clean heart. Also, Article 8 under Doctrinal Commitment says that we believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost subsequent to cleansing with the endowment of power for service. Now, we've got some very smart people in this place, and I think that most of you, if not all of you, know what the word subsequent means. It means coming after something in time, following, coming or occurring later, or after something else. <coughs> Do me a favor and cough real deeply for me, all right? You need to do it one more time there. I'm not going to stop and I'm not going to quit. I prayed very diligently about this service and about this message. And so again... I'm going to be giving you a lot of scriptures. Again, you will have them all. But I want you to listen. Faith comes by hearing and hear me the word of God. And that not, that not only applies to the faith that you exercise in God, but also the body of truth, which is known as the faith. How do you know what you believe? What does the Bible say? So, as we study the pages of the New Testament, we find that the norm in the days of the apostles and the first century church involved the following. First of all, to repent. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, chapter 3, verse 19. In the process of repenting, to believe on Jesus. Acts 16, 30 and 31. To be baptized in water. Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. Then, then, the believer was a candidate to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38. From the day of Pentecost onward, we call ourselves Pentecostals. We talked a little bit about this uh, in Bible study on Wednesday night. From the day of Pentecost onward, the gift of the Holy Spirit was available to and potential for all believers. Acts 2.39, Peter says, For the promise, that is the promise of the Holy Spirit that the Father had made, is to you and to your children 
and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. If you have not received the Holy Spirit, do not let anyone, and especially the devil, tell you that you cannot have the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 has something powerful to say on that very issue. I'm going to, I'm going to need to take just a moment on this verse because there's a, there are two statements here that are very, very important. You know this, but I'll just remind you that according to the Bible, if you're born again, you're born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who regenerated you. You don't get saved without the Holy Spirit performing that miracle called regeneration. And that's laid out in particular in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. But the Holy Spirit does something else for us in the process of us being saved. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ and into the body of Christ. Did everybody get that? So this is what Paul is talking about in the first part of 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized in the one body, whether Jew or Gentile, whether slave or free. And if, of course, elsewhere in the Bible, the Bible talks about us being baptized into Christ. It doesn't state in that setting that the Holy Spirit's the one that does it. But did you understand that every one of you, every one of us who is saved today, We've been baptized and we're part of the body of Christ. When you walked down the aisle of this church or wherever church you were in the church of God and you said, I want to join the church of God, that's not when you became a part of the body of Christ. You became a, a member of the body of Christ at the moment that you said, Lord, I want to be saved. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit did a miracle of regeneration which resulted in your being born again. Everybody say born again. But Paul makes two incredible statements here, talking to, and could I just tell you this? <laughs> the people at Corinth, they get berated so much, they get criticized so very much. But you know, those people who do that, they need to read every word that Paul said in writing to that church, and they should have read the very first words that he said. <laughs> I'm writing to the church at Corinth to the saints in Christ Jesus. <laughs> How many of you know that all saints don't always act saintly? All right. I'm getting through to somebody here. But he says something else in this verse. Not only have all of us been baptized by the Spirit into one body, but he says something else. Now again, remember my main point here today, the bottom line and all that long title is that every believer in the early church city, they reached the norm when they got baptized in and filled with the Holy Spirit. That's when they were normal. And we all want to be normal, don't we? And so he concludes this verse by saying, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Now this word that's translated made the drink is a very interesting word and I'm going to share a connecting scripture in a moment that you'll be more familiar with. This word means to make to drink, to give someone to drink, to let them drink, to furnish drink, to offer anyone something to drink. How many of you know that you can't drink for someone else? How many of you know that drinking is something that you do yourself? Remember the Bible says that when Jesus was on the cross and he first said, I thirst, and they came and they offered him something to drink and he refused to drink it? So I want you to understand that this language here is figurative, it's symbolic. And to understand it, we need to understand something that Jesus said that relates to the same subject. Only it comes uh, sometime prior to this. John chapter 7, beginning at verse 37. On the last day and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty, key word there, come to me and drink. 
Whosoever believes in me, as the scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from within him. And then John, the writer, offers a parenthetical explanatory statement here in John 7, 39. But this, by this, by what he said, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up until that time, the spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So in this statement that Jesus used, he referred to the simple act of drinking as the way to receive the Holy Spirit. Paul used that same terminology. Remember that God, the first thing in the Bible about the giving of the Holy Spirit, God used his term, Behold, the day comes saith God that I will what? Help me out here. Pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. What did Peter say? They said, what does all this mean? He said, this is the fulfillment of the, what the Lord said. Behold, the days come, saith the God, that I will pour out of my spirit. How do we receive the Holy Spirit? A part of receiving the Holy Spirit is that the process begins, first of all, when you desire him. You thirst for him. You ask for him. And Jesus gets involved in the impartation. Jesus baptizes us into the Holy Spirit. Now, that's nothing new. You know that, right? I mean, you, you learned that years ago. And in the process of Peter describing or explaining what's happening on the day of Pentecost, he pretty well concludes by saying this in Acts 2.33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, referring to Jesus, and having received of the Father the promise, or the promised Holy Spirit. And the King James says he has shed forth. That same word is used earlier in the chapter when he says poured out. Having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you now hear and see. So, in the process of your receiving the Holy Spirit, Jesus baptizes you, immerses you into the Spirit. But there's another part to that process. There are two aspects, baptism and filling. So how do you receive the Holy Spirit? You open your innermost being as though you were drinking. What has been offered to you, you receive. What has been offered to you, you accept. Amen. But here's what I want you to understand that Paul is saying to these believers. All of us have been baptized by the Spirit, placed by the Spirit into one body, into the body of Christ. And furthermore, all of us have been given the opportunity, the privilege to receive, to experience the Holy Spirit. Now, did you get that? I want you to understand and there's some things that probably I, I shouldn't say, I can't say. I could create a lot of um, turmoil between here and Keith and at 25th Street, and I don't want that to happen. But there's an undercurrent. There's an undercurrent that if we're not careful would cause us to be less than Pentecostal. And there is an inordinate amount of emphasis today by preachers of all stripes that say that if you're saved, you've got it all. That when you received salvation, you experienced everything that God had for you. So that the Holy Spirit is now resident in you, and you just need to somehow shake him up, stir him up, wake him up. I'm being very colloquial there in country, but that's, that's basically what they're telling you to do. But I want you to understand that there is a distinct difference between your being born of the Spirit and your being baptized in the Spirit. Amen? Now, let me proceed. As we look at the Scriptures... And see, believers in the, in the day of Pentecost, they didn't stop believing, they didn't stop repenting, they didn't stop being baptized. 
the norm for them. The norm was for them to proceed until they received the Holy Spirit by faith and became indwelt by him and filled with him. That was the norm. As we shall see from the scriptures, the norm for them was to have the Holy Spirit. You can have the Holy Spirit, to have the Holy Spirit and to be filled with him. Now let's look at something very specific. At the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that all who were present, every person there was filled with the Holy Spirit. You're very familiar with the scripture, but I'm going to read it so that it will get into your heart and into your mind. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven like as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house they were sitting, and there appeared unto them in cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. That was the norm. And we're going to see that that kind of sets the stage, paves the way, and becomes a precedent. The next time we read about the church in Jerusalem gathering together, the next time we read about the nucleus being in one place, the Bible identifies all of them as having been filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts 4.31, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Remember the point of this message. Forget about all the leadings. The bottom line is that the norm in the apostolic, the first century church, the norm among Peter, James, and John, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was that people be saved, <laughs> that they be water baptized to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And they had received the Holy Spirit and were filled with him. That was the norm. And as we progress in the scriptures, you will see this developing some. When the Holy Spirit was poured out on Cornelius and those who had gathered at his house, remember that he'd called in his kinfolks, he'd called in his neighbors and his friends. But listen to what the Bible says about the Activity of the Holy Spirit there. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter's preaching, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. All of them. And there the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. There you go, that, that symbol of baptism and pouring out of water. Now, let's, let's look at another setting, though, that how many of you know that we can learn from the experiences of other people? You can learn how to. You can learn how not to. You can save yourself a lot of trouble by learning from the experiences of other people. But again, I'm going to refer to you an incident in the New Testament, and this particular incident is referred to by all people who write on the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter it doesn't matter how they interpret it. It doesn't matter their take on it. They're going to refer to what I'm fixing to read to you. But hey, I got some smart folks here. You got up early this morning, and so you're going to see this. Let me tell you the lead in that I've got here. When it came to the attention of the church leaders that there were believers who had not received the Holy Spirit, guess what they did? When the church in Jerusalem, or the leadership there, when they heard that there were believers somewhere who had not yet re received the Holy Spirit, guess what they did? They didn't have a committee meeting. They didn't sit down and say, well, bless God. They're not where we are. They're not as good as we are. If they, if they had the faith we've got, if they're as hungry as we are. No, that's not what they did. Let me read to you Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 5. This sets the stage. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. How do you get people saved? You preach Christ. The next verse says, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spoke, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Fast forward to verse 12. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Now let's fast forward to verse 14. 
Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria or the Samaritans had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John and were told why Peter and John went from Jerusalem to Samaria. Who, when they had were come down, prayed for them in order that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Because as yet he had not fallen upon any of them, only they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Let me just stop right here and talk to you for a moment. Remember what I said before I read my text and I was talking about my upbringing? You don't have to be defensive. When you get around somebody and they say, well, where do you go to the church of God? Well, I go to the, or where do you go to church? I go to the church of God. Isn't that a Pentecostal church? You better believe it. Don't they speak in tongues? Well, didn't Paul? Didn't Jesus say, these signs shall follow believers? They shall speak with new tongues. You just put that thing right back on them. Amen? Paul said, I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than all of you. And by the way, Paul said, do not forget, forbid, don't prohibit speaking with tongues. I rest my case. Okay? We're right, and I'm not going to say they're wrong, but I just want to reaffirm, and I want to challenge you. I want to admonish you. I want to encourage you. If you have not received the Holy Spirit, don't let another day go by. Because remember that our Lord and Savior, at one of the most crucial moments of his life, said, I will. I'm going to pray to the Father and ask him to give you another helper so that he may abide with you forever. He just told them that he's going to leave them. But I'm going to ask that he'll give you a helper so that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth in the world, the unsaved people cannot receive because they see him not, neither knows him. But you know him because he's with you and he shall be in you. And by the way, what it said just right before that, and I'm, I'm not sure that I quoted all of verse 16, so just to make sure, I'm going to pray the Father and ask him to give you another helper that he may do what? Abide with you forever. I'm leaving. He's coming. And when he gets here, when you receive him, he's going to be with you forever. And he's not going to send to be with you. He's going to be in you. Amen? So here are these people at Samaria. Philip had gone there. He had preached the gospel like he should. The people believed. He baptized them. Word was sent by a courier, by a messenger to the head church, mother church in Jerusalem. The Samaritans have received the word of God. They're saved. They've been baptized. And so the leadership sent Peter and John, who were two of the spiritual giants in the body of Christ throughout the entire tenure of the book of Acts. They sent Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them in order that. Now, if we were in a classroom setting now, or if we were over in the fellowship hall on a Wednesday night, I may would just, you know, unpack that a little bit more. But let me see you now. Everybody is awake. Did you have your Wheaties this morning? I was kidding with somebody. They wanted to know what I had for breakfast this morning. <laughs> if we look at the language that's used here, understand this. There are a lot of things that happen to you at the moment that you believed on and that you received Jesus. But remember that the word receive is an active word. Not just an action word, it's an active word. How did you get Jesus Christ inside of you? You received him. You believed on him, you received him. That's the very same way that you get the Holy Spirit inside of you. You receive him. And so the terminology here 
simply meant that they sent Peter and John so that they could aid them, they could assist them. But the receiving had to be done entirely by those people there. If you ever receive the Holy Spirit, it's going to be because you receive him. Amen? It's not something that's automatically given to you. At the moment you got saved, at the moment you believed on Jesus Christ, you were born again. You had nothing to do with that. It's a result of your believing and a result of your receiving Jesus. You got justified. You got accepted in the beloved. You got redeemed. There are a lot of things that you can experience and that you can enjoy after you receive the Holy Spirit. Amen? But you experience the Holy Spirit the same way that you experience salvation. You receive Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, so these people were saved, baptized, had not received the Holy Spirit. Peter and John came prayed for them, laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. We are given some very specific details about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who became known as the Apostle Paul. He was on his way under authorization from the Supreme Council of the Jews, the Sanhedrin Court, authorized to arrest Christians, to persecute them if necessary, to imprison them, or even to the point to see them executed. It's about noonday, and he's just out of the of Damascus, and there's a great light from heaven. It shone. He fell off of his horse. The voice said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. And he said, Lord, what will you have me do? From that moment forward, he was a saved man. He was blind for three days. Blind for three days. And there was a certain disciple in Damascus by the name of Ananias. And Jesus spoke to Ananias and sent him on a mission. Listen to what Ananias said to Saul of Tarsus three days after he's gotten saved. Acts 9, 17, and Ananias went his way, entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, who appeared to you in the ways you came, has sent me so that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. On one occasion, the Apostle Paul, he was on one of his missionary journeys, and the Bible tells us about him meeting with certain disciples in the city of Ephesus. And he immediately asked them a question. Let me read to you this setting. Acts 19, 1, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said to them, Have you received the Holy Ghost? since you believed. Think about that. This is a, a matter of such urgency. It's a matter of such significance that this is the first time that Paul has met these people. They're strangers to him, but the Bible describes them as disciples. It turns out that they were disciples of John. But John is the man who introduced Jesus, and a number of John's disciples became disciples of Jesus. So recognizing that these men were disciples, Paul asked a very, very specific, pointed, personal question, but it was a relevant question. Okay, you, you believed, since you believed, have you received, have you received the Holy Spirit? Well, as it turns out, they had not. So what does he do? He testifies to them. He reminds them that John preached that they should believe on Jesus. He baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus and then laid his hands on them. And the Bible says, and the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and they prophesied. Remember that you're the only person who can receive the Holy Spirit for you. I'm going to have to find a place to stop 
although there's a lot more to be said, and there's a lot more scriptures. I have tried to use some that were quite specific, but there are more scriptures on this subject. Let me just encourage you. Get these outlines and read them very, very carefully. Let me, in the closing moments of this message, share a couple of things with you that keep in mind. I don't know how many of you know who John Osteen was. I'm sure that all of you have heard of his number one son. I had the opportunity of being in a meeting at least one time with John Osteen. John Osteen was, for many years, a denominational preacher. And you'll get some idea about what he was taught with some quotes that I'm going to give to you from him. You see, you would be amazed at the people who are taught that when you get saved, you have everything. And I have to tell you that we have some young preachers today who are buying into that. They don't want the Holy Spirit working and moving. They'd have been uncomfortable. And what has happened in this service this far this morning? That troubles me greatly. I heard somebody say this years ago. The denominational churches are trying to become like us, and we're trying to become like them. I don't want to ever be guilty of that. Amen? We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. Listen to what this man has to say. I quote, I was a captain of the tradition and teaching of men. Tradition cried out. In other words, what he had been taught. We have received all that was necessary when we accepted Jesus as Savior. There was no need to tear for another experience of power, for we have it all. He goes on to say, I was convinced that a person received all that he could get from God when he was saved and was washed in the blood. But he learned better. You didn't hear that. I said he learned better. He goes on to write, God's word teaches that all of his children need the power of the Holy Spirit. It is abundantly clear that the endowment of power through the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a separate experience from salvation. And I'll guarantee when he discovered that, the first thing that John Osteen did is he received the Holy Spirit <laughs> and was a powerhouse for the Lord for a number of years. Let me just leave some thoughts with you and these thoughts are building upon some of the things that I've just referred to, scriptures that I've used, but just kind of to remind you. The Bible clearly reveals that every believer has the privilege of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. In other words, this is not just something that's reserved for the few. It reveals further that they can have And the word have is actually used in the scripture that I'm going to reference. That a believer can actually have the Holy Spirit as a permanent residence living inside of him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19. You can have him as a permanent residence. James 4, 5. The scripture teaches that every believer can and should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember the first scripture that I read to you is a primary text. Ephesians 5, 18. Be filled with the Spirit. According to the Bible, receiving the Holy Spirit is a deliberative act, just as Jesus receiving Jesus is. Acts 8, 14 through 17. The biblical narrative and doctrinal portions of the Bible dispute the teachings that every believer automatically has the Holy Spirit. Teaching of the scriptures that you can be saved but not have received the Holy Spirit. Let me stop right there for a moment, and I want to close very short. But it's amazing. I have met people, I've heard of people who have never heard a message in their life, never heard the term baptized in the Holy Spirit or baptism of the Holy Spirit, never heard it before, but who received the Holy Spirit. But how many of you know that God knows your heart? And the Bible says, blessed are they who hung and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled or thoroughly satisfied. And the Lord knows your heart. You don't have to know everything. 
necessarily that I have told you this morning to get saved or to be filled with the Holy Spirit. A number of people, I've heard the testimonies, met some of these people that they just simply, they were taught the same thing as John Osteen, but they said, Lord God, whatever I've got is not enough. And surely a God as big as you, you must have something more. And if you do, Lord, I want it, I need it. Amen? And so many of them have received the Holy Spirit. I can tell you that I've seen people go through all kinds of motions and gestures and endless hours in the altar trying to receive the Holy Spirit. My, my heart goes out to them, but that really breaks my heart because he's more anxious to come into you than you are for him to come into you. Amen? At some point since I've been here, I've related the story, but some of you were not here and some of you heard it, forgot it. So let me remind you. And remember, this is all the preaching I'm going to get to do today. We had a couple that started coming to our church. It was, we were reaching out. The Lord just had worked it out where we were dealing with a lot of Catholics. A number of them got saved and received the Holy Spirit. This couple, they had come to our church. I started up by coming to a home prayer meeting. And so we just went on as though they were not there. We just acted like ourselves, and we did what we normally did in those home prayer meetings. And this lady, she was type A. So she just came up to me afterwards. She, she said, what do you have that we don't have? <laughs> well, how in the world do you tell somebody <laughs> that you're very religious and you go to church regularly, but you're not saved? And forget about the Holy Spirit, you know. But she made an appointment for them to come to see us on Monday night, and they left at 1 o'clock in the morning. And she said, I can't go back to my church, so we'll see you Sunday. So they came to our church, and they both got saved. Now, because of their religious upbringing, the thing about being grandparents and such was a big deal. So they had a, a godson. And they called him, and they said, Jimmy, come over. We've got something to share with you. He couldn't imagine what in the world it was. They, was, they were so excited. There was a happy tone in their voice. And so he got to their house, and they said, we got saved. He said, what does that mean? They said, we became a Christian. He said, well, aren't we all Christians? <laughs> we all go to church. We've been baptized. We go to the mass. They said, no, Jimmy. We really have a relationship with Jesus. Where did this happen? So they told him, and so he came down to church for a Bible study on Friday night, and the Lord began to deal with him that night. And so between Wednesday night and, or that particular thing was Friday night. We had a Wednesday night home meeting, Friday night Bible study. So he came to the Friday night Bible study, and the Lord began to deal with him, so he called me. He said, Pastor, I'm going to be in church Sunday night. I've got an issue, and I need you and some of the men to pray for me. And I said, we'll do it. And so he, at the end of the service, we took him to a room. The only time we ever did this, but because of the nature that he was having some issues with demonic activity, so Several of us took him to a room, and I remember I put my hand on his head, and it was like putting my hand on a rock. But I knew that this young man had expressed a sincere desire for his life to be changed and to know the Lord. So we prayed for him, and in a moment's time, his whole countenance changed. The Lord saved him. And so he is in the back seat of their car on the way home, and he is just... Elated. He's excited about being saved. How many of you remember when you got saved? Greatest moment of your life, right? And all of a sudden, Jimmy Britton started speaking in tongues. And boy, I'm telling you right now, that just got their attention. They said, Jimmy, Jimmy, 
do you know what's happening? He said, not really. He said, but it certainly does feel good. They said, you just received the Holy Spirit. Now, that kind of hacked them, you know, because at that point, neither one of them had received. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you've got a heart for the Lord, it matters. He knows what's in your heart. Amen? Let me leave these thoughts with you. Noted ministers and church leaders in the second and third century. In other words, people that had been converted under the ministry of the apostles, taught by the apostles, trained by the apostles. Second generation, or men who had been taught by those men who were only one step away from the apostles, taught very specifically that just because you had been born again did not mean that you'd received the Holy Spirit. That once you've been born again, you need another experience. And I want to tell you, I've got, I've got documentation that belief has continued from that day until today, from the day of Pentecost until today. There's been a belief existing and practice in the early church and throughout the body of Christ till today of praying with people for them to receive the Holy Spirit. And they pretty well trace this back to the incident of Peter and John praying for the people in Samaria that they might receive the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, there are numerous denominations that have a specific ritual that they go through in order to help them receive the Holy Spirit. And I'm told, and I can only, I can only go on what I read here, but I'm told that there used to be a time when they did this, something actually happened. But nowadays it's just become a ritual and they don't expect anything radical, dramatic, or supernatural to happen. But we know that it can still happen today, don't we? Amen? And so I want to I challenge you, folks. I want to challenge you. If you have not received the Holy Spirit, because remember, you receive the Holy Spirit to help you in every aspect of living out the Christian life. Amen? And when the forces of hell come against you and all hell breaks loose, your first thought is not to panic. Push the panic button. Because remember that if you've received him, he's made himself at home in you. He is right there, readily available to aid you, to assist you, to help you. Amen? If I could just get one musician up here. Let's just sing just a wee bit of sweet Holy Spirit. Let me remind you, remind you this is the third Sunday, so we'll be having fellowship tonight at 5 o'clock. Remember to pray for one another. We have some people in this church who are facing some very, very serious things of a physical nature. But we believe a God who's a healer, don't we? Yes, we do. We heard these testimonies earlier. God is a miracle worker. And if you, have, if you have need of prayer and you didn't receive prayer earlier, if you'll come, we'll pray for you. Or if you'll just raise your hand. But remember, let's pray for one another. Amen. Let me just see once again, how many of you have ever received a miracle before? Ever received a miracle? Amen. Amen. Sweet Holy Spirit. Sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love, and for each blessing. 